excited about this conversation. So we have three um, shared hosts tonight who are going to bring totally different perspectives to this conversation. So Dr. Andy McCabe, who is um, head of AAVMC, is going to start us off with this conversation. There's some really, um, really interesting data he's bringing to the table. Then we're going to have Dr. Um, Elizabeth Lowinger, who is the, there you go. Thank you, Elizabeth, for who is the head of, or the manager of student affairs at the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph. Um, talk with us a little bit about what they are doing in the recruitment process. And then we're gonna wrap up the evening with um, Heidi Sirota. Um, Heidi, give a little wave. So not too long ago, joined Nationwide to lead their, um, their pet healthcare division there. And she's gonna talk with us about what Nationwide is doing, not just in the pet healthcare division, but also across the company. Um, to make a difference in the diversity conversation as well. So um, some really interesting perspectives that we're going to share and it's going to be a boatload of fun. So thank you all for being with us to host and thank you for being with us to listen to what we have to say. So Heidi, you're going to lead us off with a toast. Oh, we, and we need to thank Nationwide as well for yes. being, for Jerry, very generously supporting um, this conversation coming to, to the forefront. So thank you Nationwide for helping make this happen. And we always thank say, you. if you've got a topic, bring it forward. That's what we're here for. Let's That's have right. Yeah, well, thank you for having us. It's an honor to be on the panel and to be able to host this call. Um, so hopefully we'll have some good information to share. But first, a toast. I learned that this has to be engaging and fun. And I've got my nationwide cup full of water. I wish it was bourbon. It's not. Because um, <laughs> I'm still in the office. Um, but my toast. When you think about unlocking human potential, encourage to people to bring their whole selves to work. Everything their coworkers can see with their eyes and all of the uniqueness that they can experience without their eyes uh, about you as a diverse and unique person. Cheers. 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 Thank you. That's a, that's a keeper. I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a good one. Okay, so to start us off tonight, this is where we're breaking number rule number one, but we'll let um, Andy jump in with thinking of the true state of diversity. And by that meaning, it's time for some numbers, people. So you may want to top off your beverage. <laughs> well, I appreciate the special dispensation you've given me tonight, uh, Catherine and Brenda, to share just a little bit of data. Um, but I just want to start with a brief comment. I uh, mentioned it before on this uh, same forum, in a different context that here's, here's why diversity is such an important issue for us at the AAVMC. We know the evidence is very clear that more diverse teams make better decisions. And the reason that that is, is uh, based on cognitive diversity. People have different ways of thinking about things, different uh, ways to approach a problem, different backgrounds, different heuristics. And cognitive diversity depends on identity diversity. All the pieces uh, that make us who we are, race, ethnicity, gender, these are the very obvious ones that everybody else sees about us. Not only do we see in ourselves, but everybody sees it in us. Those are extremely important. They frame the way that we see the world because they frame the way that we interact with the world. In addition, we're interested in diversity of uh, in our case, in veterinary medicine, socioeconomic status, geographic origin, uh, first generation to college, all of these types of things expand the background and identity of the students that we enroll in veterinary school and therefore impact their cognitive diversity. And as I said, we know that the evidence is clear that more diverse teams make better decisions it stands to reason by extension that a more diverse profession will be able to withstand any new challenges that come up uh, over the, the next several decades. Our students today are gonna to be practicing for on average about 40 some years. There's no way we know what the world is gonna look like in 40 years. Nobody can predict quite that far ahead. What we do know is that there are gonna be new challenges and new things that we cannot predict. So our best hedge is a more diverse uh, profession. And we do that by getting a more diverse student body. And we do that by getting a more diverse applicant pool. So at this point, I'm gonna share some data with you. I'm gonna hit my share screen. 
again. There it is. And I say share. And now you should be able to see my uh, slide chart. Can, can you see it? Can you give me a verbal? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. See. So First this time technology ever worked. <laughs> uh, aggregate racial and ethnic underrepresented in veterinary medicine, URVM representation at the US colleges from 1980 to 2020. And what you can see here is back in 1980, we had only about 4% uh, underrepresented minorities in, enrolled in our schools. And in 2000, uh, it had doubled, but look at this, it's a very, uh, very shallow slope to this curve. Beginning in 2002, right about this point here, we began an initiative uh, that we called Diversity Matters. And the idea is to um, focus some efforts at helping our schools uh, enroll a more diverse student body. And I'm pleased to say that the shape of this curve is finally starting to tick upwards. And in 2020, the class that just enrolled, uh, actually in 2019, and the reason, the, but the, will graduate in 2024, which is what the, 2023, which is what this line corresponds to, 21% underrepresented minorities. So that's the good news, right? We're making progress. Okay. We're actually increasing the number of underrepresented minorities. But let me show you the next couple of slides that will describe the challenge that we have that lies ahead. So I will interrupt really quick. For those of you who couldn't see that 21%, you can actually drag wherever the, all the photos are for you, you can actually drag that to the top of your screen. So I just wanna make sure for those who couldn't see the 21% on your screen. Oh yeah, sorry, because that's the, that's the dramatic part of the graph right. over here to the right. And so you can see it was, we were chugging along pretty flat. We started having some progress and then all of a sudden in about 20, uh, 16 or 17, we started this uh, virtuous upward cycle is how I would describe that. That's fantastic. Like I said, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, that's fantastic. I mean, to see, I know it, we're not where we wanna be, but to see that degree of impact in such a short period of time means that we're on the right track and something's working. Exactly, and, that, and what we're trying to do is work with the schools that have made the biggest increase there and see what they're doing. And in fact, we know some of their admissions practices are changing, they're uh, uh, opening up to uh, uh, different uh, types of students than they would have seen before. But let me show you the challenge that we have that's coming up. So this slide, and we're starting over here to the right, this is our first year enrolled class that will graduate in 2023. So they were just admitted in uh, 2019. And you can see the uh, blue bar here. I keep losing my cursor, so I don't know what, there it is. 75% uh, uh, white only. Uh, this next band here, the orange is uh, Hispanic. Uh, and then we have some other groups in here, including uh, black or African American, uh, Native American, two or more races. But here's my point, about 75% majority, which only leaves about 25% um, under uh, minority students. And let's see where they came from. Well, this was the applicant pool for the same class, or the, I'm sorry, for the uh, class that just went through the cycle. But you can see that uh, we're actually disfavoring uh, some of these um, underrepresented minorities in that they're more highly represented in the applicant pool than they are in the enrolled student body. It's not too bad, but there is a distinct difference. But here's where we have our real problem. This is the U.S. population enrolled in undergraduate programs throughout the United States. Do you see this? This is the slope. This is our big problem here. Our applicant pool should look much more like the undergraduate population and hopefully then our enrolled student body would look more like it. And if we take one more look at what's coming up, this is the demographic of the U.S. for children age 0 to 19. So we know that this trend is going to continue. When we talk about diversity, what we'd like to see is that our enrollment and ultimately our profession more closely mirrors the society that we serve. So eventually we would like to get to this type of a makeup in our enrolled student body so that it mirrors the population that we serve. 
So those were the slides that I wanted to share with you to give you a, what I think is a very, uh, the graphic representation speaks uh, uh, very clearly to me about the uphill battle that we face despite the great progress that we've made. I thought this was super important. So Andy had actually walked me through those slides back uh, last year when we were in Colorado for the, the VIS meeting that they had there, because I've always been challenged by one uh, major component when we talk about diversity and what does that mean from, from just a percentage wise. So, and it is my naiveness, but I don't think I'm completely alone in my naiveness there in that I live in Chicago and uh, I am a part of a very, very diverse community. And my perception of diversity means, let's just assume there are only four races on the planet, okay, just for argument's sake, that everyone would be at 25%. So my idea of diversity is that everything should be exactly equal across the board. And it wasn't until Andy walked me through the numbers that I realized we are actually, as uh, based on what the applicant pool is, what we are pulling from the younger generations or her, you know, coming forward. So it was a huge eye opening for me. I, it may not be for others on the call, but it was super important for me to really understand what does diversity truly look like for success? Because I think I was misunderstanding success in diversity um, versus what my perception of the community that I live in. So I was, I was jading myself. One other point I'd make on that is we're not looking for quotas here. So it's not that it has to be exact, but the point is we should, as a profession, uh, look more, uh, more closely resemble the society that we serve. Will we ever get like, you know, exact parity? No. And that's not really the issue. But you can see how different our enrolled mm -hmm. student body looks as compared to the undergraduate population. And then consider... Uh, our profession uh, in the world, how many uh, veterinarians who've been practicing, you know, up to and including 40, 45 years ago, when, the, when our student body was even less diverse, uh, they don't look at all like the uh, populations that they're serving. And it, why is that important? Uh, the issue here is cultural competency. So what we know from human health care, and it stands to reason that the same thing would apply here, is that health outcomes are improved when a member of the healthcare team, anybody on the healthcare team, is culturally competent with respect to the patient. In our case, it would be whenever any member of the veterinary healthcare team is culturally competent with respect to the client, the patient owner. And the reason that that's important is because it helps in communications and uh, uh, compliance and all of these issues. And so it doesn't necessarily need to be that a black client needs to see a black veterinarian. That's not what we're talking about. It does help though, if a person who might you have English as a second language uh, comes into a clinic and sees somebody on the staff, maybe it's the veterinarian, maybe it's the technician, maybe it's the uh, receptionist, uh, speaks their language or knows of it so that if there is a communication problem, they feel comfortable asking about it. Those are the types of things that we're talking about. Andrew, do you have the numbers for the actual U.S. population? Like I saw that you had the undergrad, but I, do you have the graph for the U.S. population? So no, not on this slide presentation. I don't have the total U.S. population, but you recall that zero to 19 Mm -hmm. uh, graph at the far left of my last slide. That is what is coming up. That's what uh, the United States is going to look like uh, probably within about 25 years. That, that population will move into and displace uh, the, those at the uh, higher age group that are you know, generally less diverse in our country. And so what we're looking for, I think people are predicting that we will have a majority minority population in this country by 2025 or so. That means that uh, fewer, that there will be no single demographic uh, race or ethnicity group that is more than 50% of the population. Hi guys, I have a question um, chiming in here. Earlier when you showed the, the 
uh, breakdown of the applicants and the breakdown of what the acceptance was. Have you guys logged at all what financial situation and uh, the potential privilege that's required to go six figures into debt to become a vet may take into that? And if you, I'm, I'm interested to see, given the advances that you've made, a, whether financial, um, either financial help or advice to people to understand how to how to kind of cope with the with the cost of the education and how you guys manage that. Yeah, well, first of all, hi, Isabel, nice to uh, uh, see you. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, it's a really important question. So what all that data showed was race and ethnicity based on the US Census Bureau uh, uh, categories. We follow the same categories. Um, the question you're asking is like socioeconomic status and uh, uh, those types of things. We don't collect that data directly what we do collect is Pell Grant eligibility. And Pell Grants are available only to students who demonstrate financial need. So it's a surrogate for socioeconomic status. And what we know, Isabel, is that um, in general, our admissions practices at most of our schools have disfavored students who are Pell Grant eligible. Here's the good news, though. Uh, is that we found that uh, schools that undergo, uh, there's, there's about two or three basic things. If the admissions committee uh, goes through implicit bias or unconscious bias training, there's evidence that following that training, they increase, oh, there's a cat. They uh, <laughs> increase the number of offers that they make to underrepresented minorities. Secondly, those applicants report feeling more comfortable during the, the application process. So that's number one. Uh, uh, number two is if an admissions committee practices a holistic admissions process, they also start increasing the number of underrepresented minorities and more diverse students. And we're seeing um, it's, be, it's almost getting to be a tidal wave we started with only a few schools that were adopting certain holistic practices. As it picks up and as we start demonstrating how that works and other schools see how they can do it, we're starting to do more and more. And that's that virtuous upward cycle that I described, which I think is changing the slope of that curve to that sharper upward trajectory. But you're right, uh, socioeconomic status and ability to pay for it is a factor and that's why we need to um, accommodate those students as well. It's interesting, I mean, there, there's some recent research by Animal Policy Group and, and Dr. Jim Lloyd, um, former of the University of Florida, recently, I guess it was last fall that it came out, right? And they did a deeper dive into um, the economics of students who were applying versus that too. So, you know, as, as Andy says, there's a more of an awareness now, I think of that being an actual situation. So. Um, now that there's a broader awareness and it's being brought to people's attention, we can start to do more about it. Whereas, you know, four, five, six years ago, nobody even thought to ask that question. It was a, a completely different conversation than it is now. Well, this is uh, Doug Brooks, and um, you know, can't see my picture. But uh, in, in, in a previous life, I worked uh, with Elenco, and I was uh, head of the um, um, African American Diversity Committee. And we had Dean Reed come in and speak to us. And uh, Dean Reed from the University of Purdue, who's done great things in this area, which I'm sure many of you on the phone know. And he talked about the, and the trend line looks kind of like the one you showed, which started at 4% now. I think it's, it's, it's ramping upwards. But one of the things that Dean Reed is doing uh, is actually taking, I think they have a van or a truck or something, they take into um, underrepresented communities to show kids at six or seven years old what being a veterinarian looks like. And I think when you take a look at the, the, where you showed that was 47% and the gap, 47% of the uh, student population, uh, but then it was 21% was uh, in vet school, or 75%. I think the, the, you know, yes, it's an economic issue, but I think what Dean Reed has found out is that it is a awareness issue and if if you know if you live in an area that don't have a, doesn't have a lot of pets or doesn't have a veterinarian who looks like you the chances of you wanting to become a veterinarian or hell even knowing how to become a veterinarian or knowing what a veterinarian is by the time you get to high school not college but by the time you get to high school 
if you haven't prepared yourself to be a veterinarian, then you're never going to become one. And I think that if there's something that I like to see as a group, uh, as an industry that we do is figure out how do we replicate some of those things that, you know, someone like, and Dean Lee's not the only one, but he's who I work very closely with um, in this area. Um, I think that's a key uh, step that we could take in the industry as well. So Doug, Talk it's like you know what our agenda is. That's fantastic. Because <laughs> what we're gonna what we're gonna do? Because Doug, you're right on it. Like we have to have solutions. And I was fortunate enough to have Andrea introduce me to Elizabeth, who is in Canada. One, I liked the idea of Canada's challenges and what they're going through, et cetera. But to your exact point, Doug, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and have her talk about kind of what they're doing for recruitment, of which it mimics uh, some of what you're saying um, based on the challenges that they're facing. So that is awesome. Thank you for that. Um, didn't even have to work really hard then. <laughs> so go for it, Elizabeth. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm actually in Ontario, as uh, was mentioned. And um, my, I started this job about 10 years ago. And uh, at the time, I think our numbers were very similar to what you, you were talking about, Andy, uh, about, uh, you know, we're, we're about 12, 13% diverse, just ethno-racially. And um, what our goal was, was to eventually mimic the Ontario population, which when I started this job was only about, I would say 18%, um, including Aboriginal and uh, um, different uh, immigrant populations and second and third generations, things like that. Um, so one of the first things we did, uh, which leads right into what Doug was talking about, was look at what are the um, barriers to our program that different populations might experience. And definitely finances was an issue. Um, however, in Canada, as you may or may not know, uh, our, um, our tuitions are very subsidized. So uh, our students don't pay quite as much tuition as they do in the US. However, if you're from a low income family, it still is a substantial burden. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we used to have uh, our applicants have to write the MCAT um, as part of the admissions process. And so on the basis of the fact that it was costly, we dropped that from our uh, admissions process. Uh, in addition to the fact that we were already, look, already looking at marks, so we already had an academic type of marker. Um, and we certainly didn't need another one that people had to pay upwards of $1,000 for. Um, so we looked at, at the different ways we did our admissions um, and tried to look at ways where we can make uh, the program more um, open and welcoming to different populations. And one of the uh, areas that we focused on was people who were doing um, career changes. So we have a lot of adults who look back fondly on their childhood and, and say, you know, I always wanted to be a veterinarian and uh, I've spent my last 10 years working as a banker or uh, in business or even we've had a fighter pilot join the program and I really want to become a veterinarian. It was my dream when I was younger or I never thought about it, but now that I have been, you know, um, introduced to the profession through owning a dog, I really think so that this is something that I want to do. Um, and we do see a lot of vet techs who do want to become veterinarians. I'm sure that you all know vet techs that would want to be a veterinarian. So we've made our admissions process a bit more um, accessible to uh, people who are changing careers by allowing them to appeal some of our rules, including the full-time rules. So if they have a bachelor's and they want to go back just to get the prerequisites, we'll allow them to do that part-time if they're working or if they have a family, things like that. Um, uh, the other things we looked at was we compared our numbers to uh, what the demographics were of Ontario uh, through what we were called StatsCan or Statistics Canada. And um, uh, for us, the biggest communities uh, are uh, the Chinese and the Indian community. And uh, one of the things we did was we actually went out and talked to people in the community um, and asked, so what do you think about the career of veterinarian? And uh, we don't see a lot of your kids applying to the program. Why is that? And for a lot of, especially like recent immigrant families or families that have been in Canada for one generation, the top fields to go into are still like doctor, lawyer, um, accountant business and veterinary medicine was not necessarily 
um, a high profile career that they wanted their children to go into. And so we realized that uh, if we wanted to influence the parents um, to consider vet medicine for their children, um, because the children were already being exposed to friends that had pets and um, that also wanted to be a veterinarian, the parents had to buy in. So it was a question of promoting the actual profession into the community. So we did a campaign where we had people from that community that were veterinarians uh, go on ethnic uh, radio stations and TV stations doing an interview promoting the profession as well as, you know, uh, the great stuff that they do every day and um, the role that the veterinarian plays. So um, that was part of the, the start of our, our uh, initial program. Um, one thing that, we, that I found out that was very interesting was uh, we have about, I would say, 2% um, Aboriginal uh, community in our, in our province, and we weren't seeing 2% in our class at all. And um, one of the things that uh, we discovered was that uh, it, there was a historical influence on the Aboriginal community in, in Ontario, I guess in Canada in general, but um, because the grandparents had gone through um, the, uh, the schooling issue, I know I'm, I'm sure some of you might have heard of it, that, that children were taken from their families and put in uh, Catholic schools. Um, so that left quite a trauma with the grandparents who had a negative uh, attitude towards post-secondary and pre-secondary education, uh, post-secondary, and um, that ended up influencing the parents. And it's just now in this current youth uh, that we see that effect lessening um, and trying to you know, um, influence them into choosing science as an undergrad um, has been really good. We're starting to see uh, a lot more numbers. So um, it's really important, I think, when they talk about recruiting to understand why they're making those choices. And um, sometimes it's something that definitely is not anything you've done, but it's a historical thing within the community that um, you, you sometimes will have to deal with. So Elizabeth, you mentioned when you and I chatted, one of the strategies that you've done is you've been working with the media. Yep. So uh, in, uh, especially since we're so close to Toronto, there's a very healthy um, ethnocultural media uh, that we have. We have uh, newspapers that service different communities. Uh, we have TV stations that uh, service different communities. Um, and so what we've done is uh, we've negotiated space or time on their, in their uh, uh, TV shows to interview some of our alumni or some of our students from that uh, background. And it's been really successful. So um, I think part of it, like I think Andrew touched on it a bit about having people um, that are visible, that are role models, that are from the veterinary community that so that kids can kind of see themselves uh, in their in their images, sort of thing. Um, so that's been really wonderful, and um, uh, that's been a mix of promoting the profession, and also uh, it's been fun for our alumni and our students to be involved because they feel good about uh, sharing their experiences with their community. So it's worked really well. I think that's awesome. Yeah, this, this is great. Oh, no, I was going to say just to see that that amount of change in a short period of time by targeting those communities and kind of speaking their language, so to speak, is, um, is pretty encouraging, I think, from the perspective of where we are in the US now, too. So that's but fun. I love the strategy of going to where they are and asking and, and using and leveraging those insights on specific, uh, very much like what Dr. Reed was doing as well, as, as Doug had pointed out. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but as we shift, we're talking about the state of diversity and we talk about what's happening, you know, for recruitment. And then here we've got this great example of, of what um, Elizabeth and her team are doing. But one of the things that we also wanted to do is, you know, as an organization and what um, a company like Nationwide is doing uh, within just the veterinary as well as broader, we happen to have Heidi with us. Yes, thank you. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about how um, Nationwide views diversity and inclusion. In fact, it really is a way of doing business for us. It's not um, a program um, or a campaign or something like that. 
we began a concerted effort back in 2005 around diversity and inclusion. We established an, an office of diversity and inclusion, and we hired a chief diversity officer back in 2005. And that really kicked us off on a journey um, that today has resulted in us being a very widely lauded organization specifically for our culture, diversity, and inclusion. Um, I, I don't wanna make this presentation about our accolades, but I just wanna share with you the journey and where it has taken us so far. Um, we have third-party recognition um, for being a top company for diversity, for women, for African-Americans, for Hispanics, for transgender, um, millennials, veterans, for giving back, among other things. And from really esteemed organizations and publications like Fortune and Forbes, Black Enterprise, Human Rights Campaign, Gallup, Harvard Business Review, and even the U.S. Secretary of Defense um, awarded us the Employer Support Freedom Award. Wow. So, uh, and this, as I said, this is a way of doing business for us more so than a program, and it shows up even in customer service awards that we get. Um, we, we receive from respected organizations like J.D. Power and Dalbar for using our internal DNI approach to deliver on your side service to our members. It just translates out. Our work began by building a very intentional, well-planned and documented resourced and funded, which is important, strategy, together with a complementary communications and engagement strategy to bring it all to life. Success for us didn't just happen by accident, and um, the hallmarks of, of our success are around our strategic pillars. Um, we have a pillar focused on the workplace, so focusing on sustaining a culture of inclusion and capability through learning, programming, and what we call our ARGs, which is Associate Resource Groups. Um, other companies call them employee, or, or excuse me, employee resource groups, um, and our business councils. So, so Associate Resource Groups, that is so hard to say, um, are um, associate initiated and driven, and they're completely voluntary. Um, we have uh, many of them. One of them is PAWS, which stands for Pet Advocacy and Wellness Support. That's the group that I'm the executive sponsor of. Um, and being new here, I haven't dug in as much as I want to, but it's uh, an area of passion for many of our employees. And honestly, I think we have more employees from outside of our pet business um, than inside the pet business. So it's really broad-based and, and it's fun and exciting. We also um, have a military associates resource group. That group was instrumental in fulfilling on our CEO's challenge for Nationwide to hire 1,000 veterans in five years. That challenge was so successful and that group so helpful in making it happen that we doubled down um, and increased our challenge to bring on 1,000 more. So that challenge is underway right now. In addition to these employee, or excuse me, associate resource groups, uh, we have business councils, and those are a complement that help associates find effective ways to implement um, these programs and, and ideas within their teams and inside of our businesses. So it really comes to life and then, again, comes back out through the way we service our customers, the products we develop, and the policies that we have, and so on. A second strategic pillar for us is around our workforce and how we foster talent excellence through acquisition efforts to attract and develop and retain really great talent. Um, we have amazing people here. They stay here forever. Um, we have so many people that have started right out of college and you know, are 50 and 60 years old and are still going strong at Nationwide. And importantly, we choose our associates so that they reflect the markets we serve. Um, and you know that points back to Dr. McCabe's um, um, numbers about you know people coming into the funnel don't equate to the people coming out on the other side with a degree in veterinary medicine. We really strive to make that happen. One of the ways that we do that is we partner with advocacy organizations such as the National Black MBA or National LBGT um, Chamber of Commerce or the Human Rights Campaign, or the Congressional Black Caucus, 
Um, Catalyst is a group that um, reflects women's issues and, and has recognized us as well. Um, so it's, we recognize this isn't something we can just do ourselves. Um, and so we go hand in glove with organizations, um, uh, kind of like uh, we were just talking about before, where you have to get people that represent a particular group to show the way. And so we rely on them to help us do it. Um, a third pillar is around our marketplace focus. So we extend the nationwide on your side brand and reputation through strategic partnerships, community engagement, volunteerism, philanthropy, um, diversity efforts in choosing suppliers, um, and so on. And, and um, you heard earlier me talk about um, um, you know, applying this so that it, it reaches out to our customers and beyond. Um, and we're recognized for that. We also have so much um, commitment through things, not only like, not only United Way, that's a big one that many companies are in, but so many programs, food programs and um, a variety of things, pet causes and so on. Um, and we were ranked as one of the best companies for giving back. So when you work here, you can feel good about um, how you how your efforts really affect the community in a, in a good way. The bottom line is that diversity and inclusion at Nationwide is a way we do business. Um, we see diversity as the differences we all bring to bear, um, not just those that you can see with your eyes. So in Nationwide's view, I'm diverse and everybody um, in our little Brady Bunch screen here is diverse, even though you know, a lot of us look alike. Um, we have something within us that reflects a diversity. And so it's important to bring that to work and for our company to recognize that. And um, so, there are, yeah. So there's, so there's obviously a lot of, of, of opportunity to comment here between the, all the really great information that the three of you shared with us. But I just, I love the fact, and I think whether you're in business or a veterinary practice, the idea that diversity is a way of doing business is such a profound and incredibly important foundation for anything yeah. that anybody does, right? Not a program, a way of doing business and something that you truly believe down to your core of the business. If that's all, the one takeaway um, from what people can act on from this, I think that's a pretty phenomenal you know, baseline. So that's- Well, that. you're getting into my closing toast, so. <laughs> no, don't, don't do your toast yet. Don't do your toast yet. I, I would say, you know, as a call out to Mia Carey, who's on here, and she's with the Pride BMC, is that one of the things that, that this, this is with your eyes only, but one of the things that I have always appreciated about Mia is, you know, when I've had conversations and we're looking to recruit people to do different things, she is the first one in the most positive, amazing way to say, you know, what kind of, of diversity do you have? And as a result of her saying that to me more than once or twice, I, I love you for it, it's been fantastic, that now I now say that. And so it's funny when I'm in now meetings and people are asking, the question is, well, can we change the makeup? Um, just get the same qualified, all that, but can we, can we change it up? And so it's amazing when you're willing yeah. to, to speak forward for it, um, that how things will begin to change as well. So I have just a huge thanks to Mia for that because it has changed me. And so I appreciate that. Mia. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, along with seeing diversity in a more broad way than, you know, you might be held accountable for. Um, it's important also that we um, employ a, a, a discipline of inclusion because we believe that unlocks and ignites the powers of those differences. Um, and we create that inclusion through an approach that we call CARE, C-A-R-E. Um, so promote inclusion through challenging work, that's the C, appreciation, respect, and an engaging environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know, I, I think the highest level view of nationwide diversity and inclusion approach, and it really has become what we do. We do bleed it. Um, and, you know, it's just how we operate. Oh, fantastic. I think when yeah. we talk about uh, diversity and inclusion, we should also look at it from the point of view of equality of opportunity for mm -hmm. who might want to become a veterinarian and, um, for them to understand how wonderful that career can be and how varied it can be. Good point, Elizabeth, absolutely.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. There's got to be some of you who like have questions or comments you're just dying to make. So, but we are getting close to the end because we always promise you that we won't keep you long. But yeah. so if there's any, you know, parting shots or comments, I mean, it'd be interesting, you know, Ellen, with your new role and how you're doing and what you're seeing and not to put you on the spot there, Ellen, sorry. <laughs> I have to take myself off mute. Um, yeah, sitting here in my little town place suites room, uh, waiting uh, 18 more days till I get into a house, yay. Um, so for those of you on the on the call that don't know me, um, I'm Ellen Lowry and I am the new director of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital at Purdue. So yes, huge shout out to uh, Dean Willie Reed, who's the dean there because he really did bring diversity to the school and and is a huge champion of that. Purdue has a lot of great diversity initiatives and programs. The program that Doug was referring to is called This Is How We Roll, R-O-L-E, as a role model. And it is a van that actually goes out into the communities um, and so that um, underrepresented groups can see from a very young age, because we know we got to get them when they're young, right? You can't wait till they're high school students. Um, you want to expose them to the opportunities and show them that they too could be a veterinarian if that's what they chose to be. So um, many of you may know that Purdue does have a diversity certificate program that is being um, revised and updated, which is very exciting. And so um, uh, we're hoping that that will roll out here in the next year or so. And and so, yeah, a lot of great things on the forefront, and I'm just uh, really excited to not only be a part of, of this group, but be a part of Purdue and, and be able to um, raise the awareness of, of some of those initiatives and just um, continue to champion diversity and inclusion um, across our profession and just across the world. That's awesome. And we love your bird. Thank you. I know whenever I talk, she has to. So what I do think is funny, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but Andy's cat was walking, disappeared, and then a tail showed up behind Mia. Yeah. <laughs> and I, thought, I thought, how hysterical is that? What we need is really an animal, a cat, a dog that would walk across and just show up in everybody's screen. Diane okay. is usually the only one who has a cat. Um, right. on, on the call. So I think that that's fantastic. So we, we do need to Wrigley is, uh, Wrigley is lying on my feet, keeping them warm here in the office. So we do have a golden retriever represented. You just can't, you can't see her fuzzy face. Well, Lily's ears kept perking with the bird. So she kept like, what is that noise? So it was kind of funny. So um, diversity, right? Look yeah, talk diversity. about, yes, there you go. Animal yeah. diversity. That is fantastic. Any like parting comments so that we can make sure everyone is finished? This has been so, well, there she is. Um, so, so exciting for um, me and Brenda in particular. We've been wanting to have this conversation a long time. So um, any additional thoughts? And I'm going to mute myself. Yeah, or last minute questions too. I mean, happy to entertain um, that while we have a few minutes here together and then we will end up with our parting thoughts and parting toasts. Some of you are awfully quiet. Oh, Mia, you're on mute. Hold on. Oh, wait, do I need to get her? There you go. You're good. Am I good. back on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just wanted to thank Brenda and Catherine. I don't know why it's reverberating back, but I just want to thank you for teeing up the conversation. Oh, you're welcome. This is yeah. a good one. We need to do it more often. So anyone who wants to bring more conversations about diversity forward, bring them on. We love yeah. it. There's so many legs to this conversation, right? It's like, how do we define diversity? It, it's the way we look. It's the way we act. It's the way we feel. It's the background we came from. You know, it's all those things that influenced us. So this is such a multifaceted conversation and makes us all better people and makes for a better world that we live and work in. So, you know, tee it up. See it up, friends. We are going to be having a conversation that is just an XY chromosome conversation where we're just going to be talking about where have all the men gone. And we're talking about the recruitment of younger men into the profession. So I want to be really clear. It is an XY chromosome discussion <laughs> so that we are just simply looking at that piece of the pie. But I think it's important to hear from students about what are they experiencing as they're coming into the profession? What are they seeing, et cetera, from the younger generation? Um, and so I think we can learn a lot from that conversation as well. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So much hey, to say. Dr. McKay, um, going all the way back to the, the population that's actually applying to veterinary school and the difference between um, the population overall and then the percentages that are applying to vet school, 
have we overlaid the demographics of pet ownership to oh. see maybe where those targeted communities would most likely be to roll out a program uh, like they're doing at P Purdue? Uh, no, we don't have that uh, information directly. But what we do know, it, it's a, a fallacy to believe that, uh, that, for instance, some underrepresented groups don't have pets or that's why they're not interested in veterinary medicine. The rate of pet ownership may not be exactly the same, but what we do know is that there are many animals <clears throat> in uh, all sorts of communities, uh, many of uh, which are not receiving any veterinary care whatsoever. The other thing that's important to remember is that uh, although companion animal medicine is certainly the largest part of our profession, about 80% of veterinarians are engaged in fee-for-service practice and the, the vast majority of them are in companion animal practice. There are many other things that veterinarians do uh, and that we need veterinarians to be doing. And in fact, maybe this is the, the real issue, Greg, uh, because it's like, um, when we talk about what will be the challenges of the future, you know, it doesn't take very long. If we just look back at the turn of the 20th century, uh, when uh, horses were replaced by automobiles, uh, everybody said, well, that's the end of the veterinary profession because all veterinarians did was work on horses. They were essential to the infrastructure of the entire country for agriculture, transportation, every single aspect of society depended on horses. So what it took is a diverse type of thinking of other people saying, well, you know, we can use what we know about horses and we can start working on uh, livestock in a similar way. And then all of a sudden the value of livestock rose and then it became economically uh, 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 sustainable to support veterinarians working in that area. Similarly, as uh, livestock production has become very vertically integrated, many fewer veterinarians are doing that. Uh, beginning you know, in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, that's when companion animal medicine took off. So what's going to be the next wave? We don't know, but I, I can almost guarantee you that we won't, that veterinarians need to be doing, will be doing other things besides companion animal care in about the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. And I don't know what that is, but the only way we're gonna prepare for it is by having people from different backgrounds who look at how we do business and they say, well, have you thought about applying it over here or over here? And no, we haven't, because <laughs> we all come from this background. And that, to me, that's the real issue, is we gotta be prepared for uh, new markets and breaking into new ideas. Very true. Excellent comment. What, Brenda? Oh, I thought that was, I mean, ex excellent comment. I just am so just enthralled by all of the really smart comments and all the, the, the positive opportunities that we're presenting here just in this brief conversation we're having right now. And that is what the Bridge Club's all about. Yeah. Which is fantastic. So now we are at the point for the closing toast, our dear friend, Heidi. Absolutely, raise your glass. I got so, just enough left. I got just enough. Just enough. Here's to diversity. It's the difference we all bring that can be leveraged and not just what you see with your eyes with a chaser of inclusion, which unlocks and ignites the power of those differences. Cheers. Beautiful. Cheers. Cheers.